I'm Emily Jashinsky. I'm Josh Hammer. I'm Andrew Stepman. And I'm Will Chamberlain. And this is NatCon Squad, where common good and common sense meet. NatCon Squad is produced by the Edmund Burke Foundation, the home for national conservatism. Subscribe now on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're actually going to start with a a story that I wrote this week on the another contribution to the Twitter files that I think has a whole lot to say about institutional rot in this country. Uh, We're going to kick it over to Josh, who's going to talk about the the battle between progressivism and popular sovereignty. Then Will is going to talk about Trump taking aim at DeSantis. And Inez is going to close us out with the facts about police shootings, as uh, sadly, that's in the news again this week. So I'll start it off. Um, Yesterday, I was planning to write a a long story on uh, the Hamilton 68 reveal by Matt Taibbi's Twitter files report from last Friday. That's a mouthful. um, And it's kind of a crazy story. It's not so inaccessible. It's not as inaccessible as some Russiagate stories are. um, But the bottom line is basically that a bunch of ex-FBI people uh, sponsored by the German Marshall Fund and something called the Alliance for Securing Democracy created a dashboard um, that would produce their intended results. Their intended results were to show uh, Russian bots proliferating across Twitter, spreading foreign disinformation. Um, Twitter, as Matt Taibbi's files show, he, he got emails that found Yoel Roth had reverse engineered the Hamilton 68 methodology um, and found that their list was BS. He used that word exactly. It was nonsense. Um, Like in 2017, in the years since, Hamilton 68 has blanketed our media. It's hard to actually overstate how huge Hamilton 68 has been in driving the Russian interference discourse. So what we have here, um, and and one thing that I found in uh, my attempt to write this long piece on it is that Twitter seems to have lied to Congress. They seem to have lied to the media. They seem to have been lying to the public um, because as you know, Adam Schiff and Diane Feinstein were demanding, uh, they, produce evidence that they were cracking down on Russian disinformation, Russian disinformation, citing Hamilton 68's work, um, Twitter said, well, you know, Hamilton 68 doesn't make their results and their full methodology public, so we can't really help you. Meanwhile, privately, um, if you look back at the emails Taibbi found, much, much earlier than when they said that, months earlier, they were saying, we have the list and we know it's nonsense, but that all remained internal. So they sort of allowed Hamilton 68's narrative to fester in media and to really drive the conversation in an anti-Trump way. Um, And by the way, it wasn't just conservatives that were on this list. It was also sort of like anti-establishment leftists that were being accused of Russian bot activity by these ex-Intel people. Um, One of the guys behind the dashboard, his name is Clint Watts. He was an an NBC News contributor and an MSNBC contributor through all of this. Elite universities, including my own alma mater, GW, um, and Harvard and Princeton, boosted the Hamilton 68 research. Um, And again, that's as did all of these Democratic politicians and the media. It is just an incredible story of institutional rot in the United States of America that um, you could have these ex-Intel people creating, concocting science that would confirm the media's priors, selling it to the media as, you know, this like major story and science that proved Russia collusion. The media unskeptically swallowing this and regurgitating it repeatedly for years. Elite universities swallowing this obviously dubious project for years and spreading it. Um, And meanwhile, Twitter did nothing. And and worse, they appear to have even lied um, in the opposite direction. So I know that there's a lot of moving pieces and parts to the story. It's kind of a hard knot to disentangle and it gets easy to make these Russiagate stories um, sound you know, conspiratorial or, you know, like they're just these these crazy knots to untie. Um, but this one, I think, speaks volumes. So with that, I'll turn it open to the group and see what everybody else's thoughts are on uh, Taibbi's new reporting. Um, well, I, I don't know. I thought it was really stunning and really impressive. Uh, and again, it's I think one of the things that I came out of the uh, Taibbi reporting for me was 
it's just, it was just all fake. They just made up a list of, of accounts that they came up with out of nowhere, just to, pulled it out of nowhere and said, these are Russian bots. And Taibi himself would go interview people who were on that list and they were like normal random people, <laughs> just normal Americans who were, you know, not a fan of the Russia-Ukraine war or just pro-Trump or something. And it, it, it's, and I mean, it's again an indication that the primary promulgators of, you know, mis, dis, and malinformation are the mainstream media who seem to be so concerned about it. Uh, and, and this is, I mean, yet another example, it's very similar, I think, to the the analog is, is when Reid Hoffman, you know, who said he was like looking out for Russian bots and trying to fight Russian bots, actually created a fake bot army to like create, uh, attack Roy Moore in the run-up to the, Al or support Roy Moore with Russian talking points or something in the run-up to the Alabama runoff election back, I think, in 2017. Um, so, you know, this is not the first time the, the left does this stuff. They're they're way more focused on it. And I, I don't know another instance, you know, the right's quote-unquote misinformation is usually not this, like, intentionally concocted nonsense in the sense of it's usually just sort of this emergent order of BS that comes from the fringe a little bit. But the it's very different. On the left, this stuff just comes from the top down. They actually have organizations that, you know, are structured to promulgate misinformation and then feed it to the mainstream media. This is a far more pernicious phenomena, I think, than like conspiracy theories on 4chan or 8chan. And yet the media just doesn't miss a beat. Uh, you know, it's far more, you know, the stuff on 4chan and 8chan, not a lot of influential people believe that. Most people don't act on it. Uh, this stuff was believed and like cited by the, by congressmen, by legislators, by all, every mainstream media outlet. It just seems way, way worse. And yet we never, of course, we never get any sort of apology for correction from news outlets whose job it is to be objective. Yeah, so, I, I'll, I'll go, no, go ahead. I, I only have a really brief point, which is the university, NGO, think tank, private company, and government nexus in all of this, right? Um, you, The fact that you have allegedly, so private companies, universities and, and NGOs or think tanks, and you know agency folks, whether in the intelligence community or elsewhere, essentially all having the exact same biases to the point where the, I actually think it's, it's um, it's worse. I doubt this is promulgated, quote unquote, on purpose, as in, I doubt that, it, I mean, obviously in Twitter, in this case, there was the actual, they already retconned it and realized this is this is total crap, right? Um, and they just said nothing, which is a, a, a different, um, or even actively, um, according to your reporting, Emily, actively like pronounced on it in Congress and lied to Congress about it. Uh, but that's already kind of further down the line of this complex. Initially, the acceptance of this stuff usually comes from the fact that there is such a uh, harmonious worldview between these allegedly different um, organizations and such similar people populating and making decisions in these organizations that they coordinate on a mass scale without actually having to coordinate. Um, and I, I think that's that is just structurally over and over and over and over again the problem that we confront now today. Like that is actually our form of government right now. Um, so I, I don't know, the structure of that is just jumps out at me, the fact that you can, you can have all of these different allegedly different sectors, um, from media, to academia, to the private sector, to the government, all coordinating without the need to actually like have a meeting every Monday morning and say like, okay, this is our marching orders today, guys. Yeah, so I guess I have two buckets of thoughts, one of which kind of dovetails with Will's comments and one of which dovetails with Inez's comments. So the part of the of, of my response that kind of has more to do with what Will said is, um, you know, this just reveals the lie to anyone who did not realize the bald faced nature of that lie already that the left's years long campaign to stamp out quote unquote misinformation and disinformation is pure unadulterated BS. Um, it, you know, it is pure partisan malarkey, you know, as, as our friend and frequent co host Ben Weingarten has been saying for you know, uh, the entirety of the Biden administration, at least, I mean, a lot of this kind of goes back to kind of January 6th is a very kind of tangentious jumping off point for the broader kind of war on, on wrong think. But like how, I mean, what Will said is just totally accurate. I mean, you know, obviously on, on the, on the right, I mean, you know, it depends how you want to use the term, right. But there were, you, you know, there were some admittedly fringy figures like Alex Jones of Infowars. He obviously has been the defamation lawsuit with, with, with Sandy Hook. 
I mean, there are some people involved in, in legitimate disinformation campaigns. You know, there, there's Gateway Pundit, who I haven't exactly been keeping up to date on what Gateway Pundit's been putting out for the past few years. But historically speaking, that was not always the most reliable, the most reliable source of information. But this just totally pales in comparison to what Emily is talking about here. So they are not at all synonymous. And, you know, the fact that kind of the media has just eaten this up hook, line, and sinker just totally gives away the game that there is some sort of purportedly objective idea of what misinformation and disinformation is. It's just total nonsense. You know, this current, it, we, we discussed on, on a fairly recent episode of this show, if I recall correctly, this pending legislation in the House, I, th I think it was Sheila Jackson Lee, if I remember correctly, introduced it, the horrific congresswoman out of the Houston, Texas area, basically trying to ban large swaths of, of race adjacent so called hate speech. Uh, at Newsweek, we actually have a really nice op ed up uh, this week from Sharice Trump on kind of the, the follies and pitfalls of adopting European style hate speech. But, hate speech legislation. So I would encourage the listeners and viewers of this podcast to kind of go ahead and check that out as well. And then kind of, um, you know, the other thing that Inez was talking about there, um, actually, Inez, what were you just talking about? I totally lost my, my line of thought. <laughs> I literally had something that I wanted to say about you. There's, there's this coordination because it's yes. the same kind of Thank people you. who went through all the same schools <laughs> and have the same views, even though these are allegedly completely different sectors of American life. Yes, no, thank you. I, and and the, only, the only point I wanted to make with that is just to use the term confirmation bias, because that's obviously what is going on here. I mean, this is obviously just the metastasis of a homogenous kind of groupthink monoculture, and, you know, it is uh, a confirmation bias is a hell of a drug, and I think, guess that's my other takeaway from this as well. But really, kudos to you, Emily, for flagging this. Thanks, is really Josh. Amazing. And on that note, I'll kick it over to you. Okay, so uh, I, I guess slightly similar thematically, what I want to talk about here. So my re most recent column was uh, titled Progressivism versus Popular Sovereignty. And, you know, th to me, this is kind of playing off of what I was talking about last week, too, actually. So technically speaking, what I was talking about last week was judicial supremacy and juristocracy, and specifically the judicial reform debate that has been resulting in all these left wing protesters in Israel. But for this column that I most recently wrote, I, I was actually specifically talking about a letter from 16 state attorneys general who wrote a letter to House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, basically saying that in your power as uh, as the speaker of one of the two houses of Congress, you should do everything you can to try to get the Biden administration to cease using the, the legal frameworks of a quote unquote emergency footing when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. And you know, from a legal perspective, kind of invoking national emergency has all sorts of kind of tangible ramifications when it comes to CDC, FDA, HHS. You know, recall, of course, that the mRNA vaccines have never been fully FDA approved. It, it, it's been on, quote unquote, emergency use authorization ever since day one. And one thing that these state attorneys general, the, the letter was spearheaded by Alabama's uh, generally excellent attorney general, a guy named Steve Marshall, so this letter from Attorney General Marshall and his co-signers actually quotes President Biden himself from, I think it was last September or, or roughly around then, where he said, oh, yeah, the pandemic is over. So, you know, if the pandemic is over, then why is the federal government actually now um, uh, appealing Judge Catherine Mizell's heroic ruling um, here in Florida from last April, where she put a national injunction on the CDC's mask mandate. But the broader thematic point of this column that I made, which I think is kind of really kind of the, the upshot here, and this is how it dovetails with the judicial reform debate in Israel, this is how it dovetails with what just happened to Bolsonaro in Brazil, to all the various European Union squabbles, especially between Hungary and Poland and Brussels. The, the, the similar theme here is the exact same everywhere. It is just this broader notion of progressivism, which is best encapsulated by that infamous Rahm Emanuel exhortation to never let a good crisis go to waste. And you know, typically speaking, the progressive modus operandi is to uh, is to weaponize that mentality via either administrative or judicial fiat. The administrative biomedical security state is the preferred means here domestically. The judicial supremacy is is kind of the means in Brazil or Israel in, in recent memory here. And my conclusion that I kind of uh, you know arrived at, which I think is, is is a good conclusion for NatCons, although you know I, I will be interested to hear if you guys agree with me. Um, my personal conclusion is that in today's more kind of populist inflected times, where you have all of these kind of right of center, slightly more traditional leaning populaces, both here in America and all across the world, that are frequently it seems at loggerheads with these kind of monoculture kind of 
groupthink, confirmation bias, adult elite institutions, whether it's administrative bureaucracies or, or Supreme Court tribunals or, or all of the above, I think that the imperative for conservatives and especially for national conservatives is to try to repoliticize as much as possible that which has been depoliticized by the administrative state or the judiciary. Um, you know, as some of our, uh, you know, quote unquote, post-liberal friends, you know, folks like my friend Sol Ramari, as they like to say, you know, we need to try to st start to make things genuinely political again, right? This is kind of the whole animating spirit between kind of the whole economics rethink and American Compass and, and Orrin Cass and all that is to kind of bring back the idea of economic statecraft. But there's no such thing as statecraft in general if progressive elites are just hiding behind kind of emergency status, whether, whether again, it's in the biomedical security state or some Supreme Court halfway around the world. So, you know, I, I guess I was trying to draw a direct line from what is happening here domestically by a COVID to these kind of Supreme Court judicial supremacy battles the year over. So I guess, first of all, do you guys buy what I'm saying as far as kind of drawing a line um, from domestically to, uh, to internationally like that? And second, do you agree with kind of the, the basic conclusion that NAVCON should be basically engaged in trying to repoliticize as much as possible? Well, I certainly agree with the second part of the conclusion that the, the story of the 20th century in many ways uh, has been the expansion of the franchise uh, and the shrinking of the, the political, right? The shrinking of the body of things on which citizens are allowed to deliberate. Um, and, and as you point out, Josh, that comes from two different forms, right? Um, one ostensibly within limits legitimate, uh, one form of, of sort of anti-democratic power uh, in the United States properly, the judiciary, right, is, is placed at several degrees of remove from, from popular will, right? Uh, but of course it can usurp uh, essentially the rights of citizens to, to self-govern when it extends beyond its mandate as it has. Um, and then the second, the administrative state that never had actually the legitimacy uh, to govern um, and now there's sort of a pincer movement on the political from both sides, on one side from the judiciary and on the other side from the, the sort of technocratic managerial state, right? Um, and, and just as a note here, like, liberal democracy, uh, that phrase, I just find it really funny because that phrase is constantly brought up by the left. Uh, but in practice, they define these oppositional, not just intention, of course, and democracy are intention. I mean, I think Shadi Hamid has a, a minimalistic conception of democracy, right, that doesn't include almost any sort of liberal concepts other than uh, the vote. Um, but uh, so there is obviously some tension between the liberal part and the democracy part. Um, but but it's fun funny to me that these people are conditional to each other, right? That whatever the content of liberal is essentially wipes out the power of democracy. Um, and I do think you're right to point to the fact that, fact that there is this, this push and pull, not just in the United States, um, but in many countries around the world where the sphere of the political has shrunk so much that in a very practical and not abstract way, it has shut out the debate on an increasing series of problems. Immigration is a great example of it. Um, an increasing series of problems that actually touch citizens' lives, and they've sort of woken up and discovered they don't have the, the power to effectuate almost anything about something that is just so obviously squarely within the political, right? Um, and just, just uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up here with, with one more example that I think is really illustrative of your point, Josh. Look how Dobbs was framed, right? Um, putting abortion back into the political sphere is exactly what happened, right? It was illegitimately taken away from the American people to deliberate on through their normal systems of government. Um, and then it was reintroduced to that system. And the entire thing was framed as an attack on liberal democracy. So that, I think that's just, this is just a perfect illustration. Um, and I, I, by the way, I, I think it, it'll be good for this country, um, quite aside from the content of the issue of abortion, um, I think it'll be good for this country to work some of those atrophied muscles of self-government uh, on an issue that is of moral importance is very serious. Like, um, so in any case, yeah, I, I think you're, you're completely right that there's a pincer movement going on that's squashing the political from both sides. This is not, I mean, all of us know this is not a recent phenomenon. This is a phenomenon at least happening over a century, but it has it does seem to have come to a certain uh, head in a lot of these issues where the political system properly defined cannot deal with the concerns of the people in a very pragmatic way. And I think that is really um, 
it's making a lot of Americans realize we, we live in something much more like a tech, uh, a sort of technocratic oligarchy than we do live in a democracy. And I think that's what's really, a lot of countries are discovering something similar. And, you know, a really quick follow-up point on that is one thing that was exposed after Dobbs is, uh, and you can see this in California where Inez is from, I'm not actually sure that a big chunk of the American public um, sort of supports the concept of a constitutional republic anymore. I think if you make the argument to them about the Electoral College or the Supreme Court in a left populist way, they're more receptive to that because we've had such a uh, lack of sort of civics education and because of the way the administrative state has careened completely out of control and um, our sort of lapsing support for concepts like free speech, um, all of those kinds of things that, you know, I, I think a lot of people, there's just confusion right now and just misunderstanding swirling about how this stuff actually works and how it's supposed to work. Um, but even if you know, we, we had a functioning sort of system where the administrative state was less vast and overreaching and, um, you know, our tech oligarchs were also less vast and, and overreaching. I still don't know if you could make the argument to the American public anymore, truly, um, about the, the proper functioning of a, and the benefits, the virtues of a constitutional republic, um, because I just, I don't think we have the, the kind of uh, civic cultural appreciation of that anymore. Yeah, I mean, I've said before that whenever you hear our democracy, you can just substitute our oligarchy for accuracy. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, use um, our, like when you hear our democracy, they, you, they're they using the word our for a reason, and we are not part of their collective our. Like the our in that democracy is the democracy of the civil service, the bureaucrats, the academics, with Curtis Yarvin I'll ultimately refer to as the cathedral right, just a constellation of the mainstream media, government, civil service, and academia, um, that people move between those things for a reason. Uh, it's like those are the people in charge, and that's that's the functioning of that power. And so, um, obviously, actual popular sovereignty is therefore a threat to our democracy in that sense, because it is a threat to overturning that entire structure of draining the swamp, of removing, of decreasing the power of the civil service. Um, and there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of interesting dynamics, I think, I mean, you could, you know, when a Republican president is in power, the, the dynamic becomes our democracy becomes those actual institutions versus the White House. And when a Democrat president is in power, uh, instead, it's the president's, it's the federal government versus the state governments that are now fighting against them, like whatever, basically, our democracy ends up being whatever element of the federal government liberal elites control. <laughs> and that's effectively um, what how, how that function works. But uh, moving on, I'm I'm talking about Trump going after DeSantis. Uh, so Trump has decided to go hard after DeSantis, despite the fact that DeSantis has not even yet announced his run. Although, in realistically, like DeSantis is probably 90% likely to end up running for president. But he, on Truth Social, um, continuing saying that uh, you know the only way we'll the, that's the only way we will make America great again. Ron DeSantis, who I made governor in both the primary and the general, is also a globalist, and so are his donors. Jeb Low Energy Bush was next to him last week. In another truth, quote unquote truth, um, he said that the revelations about Ron DeSanctimonious doing far worse than many other Republican governors during COVID, including that he unapologetically shut down Florida and its beaches, was interesting indeed. So it's, we have this sort of bizarre world where now Trump is going after Ron DeSantis as a globalist who is terrible at handling COVID. And, you know, he did he did highlight, you know, keynote the National Conservatism Conference. I have a feeling he's very much on board with the things that we think. Uh, Mr. DeSantis. But more to the point, it, it, this is a very bizarre line to take. I, I don't know why the, the Trump people have thought it's a good one, because it's pretty obvious that Ron DeSantis was actually the, the best governor of the country on COVID. There's a reason so many people like Josh um, himself moved to Florida uh, during COVID. It was just a pleasant place to be, and they were they were very intelligent about it. And I, I you know, every time, like, I think, uh, Trump lost Bill Mitchell the last couple of days, which is a remarkable person to lose. I didn't really see that one coming. But I think we're, you know, I, I have a long term thesis that ultimately, uh, you know, Trump is going to have a real problem with DeSantis. I think I think DeSantis is actually going to clean his clock. And I'm kind of it's almost like I feel like this is kind of sad to watch that there's there's they don't have anything better to go after DeSantis for than trying to claim he was bad at handling COVID. And I think it's just remarkably asinine. So I don't know what you guys think of all this, but I'm, I'm, I'm on the, I would like DeSantis to be president and I think he's going to clean Trump's clock. 
So, you know, let's just stipulate a caveat, obviously, <clears throat> that, you know, DeSantis is currently just focused on the Florida legislative session. I mean, he has not announced anything, but I personally happen to agree with Will that there's a very high likelihood that he does run. Um, th there's a few things to say about this. One is talk about just like a really bizarre issue for Donald Trump to try to hit Ron DeSantis on. First of all, you know, DeSantis' track record, you know, I think by his own admission, I mean, you know, at the very, very, very beginning for the first few weeks, maybe the first month or so, he was erring on the side of caution when it came to masking and stay in place and locking down and stuff. Uh, you know, frankly, so was I. I mean, I, 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 you know, for those first two weeks to stop the spread, at least probably probably for the better part of that first month from kind of mid-March to mid-April 2020, roughly speaking, I think if, I, if I recall correctly, by early May, I, I remember thinking that we had seen enough data to know that this was going to be a ruse. But at least for those first three or four weeks, whatever, I think, you know, anyone should have had wiggle room. Um, but after that, he was the best governor in the country on this issue. I mean, like bar none, period, full stop, end of story. There's also this bizarre retconning operation going on from some folks in MAGA world to make you think that, you know, that Christy Nome had, was and always has been and is this like absolutely courageous, heroic kind of anti-COVID fighter. You know, she tried to lock down South Dakota, was overridden by the South Dakota state legislature, as Nate Hockman has discussed. And then after the fact, tried to try to claim credit for it. So I find that whole retconning operation, you know, a, a gaslighting, frankly, to be a little bizarre as well. I guess, you know, just the kind of like you know, zooming out a little bit is looking at what we're looking at right now. Um, you know, DeSantis is clearly just living in Donald Trump's head rent free. I mean, that is frankly what is going on right now. Uh, Ron DeSanctimonious is a, is a ridiculous, ridiculous epithet. I mean, you know, we are very far removed from kind of the, you know, the 2016 campaigns when he was going after Jeb or that. And, you know, the line that I keep on coming back to that I've, I've heard from some friends and I happen to agree with I obviously, like it's early on and, you know, we'll see what happens. And Trump was just in New Hampshire. He was just in South Carolina. It's like, we'll see how this campaign develops. But it's starting to look a lot like Elvis in Vegas, you know, like someone who's just frankly, just kind of like fat out of it and is like on the verge of retiring, probably needs to know when to kind of bow off stage. You know, for, for the sports fans out there, maybe a better uh, analogy might be kind of Brett Favre going to the New York Jets to play quarterback when he really should have kind of hung up the spikes a few years ago. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's probably, you know, if I'm putting on my pure kind of forecasting prediction hat, this in way too early juncture, I, I definitely think it's it's a live race. Um, my open and explicit preference is for DeSantis to be Trump if he does indeed run, but I, I definitely think that there's a chance Trump could prevail. But, you know, I know that attacking DeSantis over COVID, I, I mean, that dog just won't hunt. <laughs> I mean, like, I, there's just no other way to say it. And Trump is just so weak on, on the COVID issue, too. I mean, to this day, he defends all, everything uh, pertaining to Operation Warp Speed. He defends the mRNA vaccines. You know, Candace Owens got into him, got into it with him over that issue. So this is not a good issue for Donald Trump to try to pick a fight with Ron DeSantis on. The guy who basically just deferred to Fauci Burks and the entirety of the biomedical security state is not going to win a COVID fight with the governor of the freest state in this COVID world who just successfully uh, petitioned the Florida Supreme Court to impanel a grand jury to investigate you know, product fraud in the, in the mRNA vaccine. So th this is a losing fight for Trump to pick. And I, I, I guess I'm not sure exactly, frankly, why at this way too early juncture he's picking this particular fight. I agree that this is an odd fight for Trump to jump on um, because I think it's one of the reasons he ultimately didn't prevail in the 2020 election. I think if he had had a, a more hawkish position on COVID, actually, um, that would have been the kind of moral clarity um, that was needed. I mean, a lot of conservatives were taking COVID extremely seriously um, in January, February, and March because it seemed as though there was uh, the potential of a Chinese bioweapon or of something like a lab leak really early on um, that we were being like actually very much injured, gravely injured by a hostile for foreign power. And I think if Trump had kind of latched onto that narrative, um, it would have opened up a moral clarity that would have allowed us to kind of navigate some of these big questions better about when, when Fauci is suggesting these guidelines, and they're also supported by the World Health Organization and all of these other people, um, who should we be really listening to? I, I think the administration um, would have done a lot better uh, politically, um, uh, politically and, and morally had that ha uh, been clear. So I'm not sure that this is Trump's ticket. As for the sort of duration of the Trump-DeSantis rivalry, 
rivalry. I still think it's really hard to see how that shakes out because we don't know what we don't know. It's hard to um, anticipate the unexpected. Um, You know, what is the FBI going to do to Donald Trump? What is the uh, DOJ going to do to Donald Trump? And how does that play with voters? There's still a lot of kind of cards on the table um, that could take that in a million different directions that could further endear Trump to voters. I do generally think his his post-presidency has been politically weak, um, and that is juxtaposed with a politically very strong DeSantis governorship. So uh, it's it's not at the moment a really great juxtaposition for Donald Trump. Um, And this is particularly, this issue is not a great juxtaposition for Donald Trump either. Uh, And I think it speaks to some of his political vulnerabilities going forward. Um, I do still think it's really hard to predict how that shakes out in a potential primary. But. Yeah, don't don't underestimate the trust factor um, with Donald Trump. There are a lot of people in this country uh, who just mistrust every voice that isn't Trump's. And there's very there are very good reason reasons for that. Um, and when, once once the institutions break break your faith, um, it's very easy uh, to, to lose faith in success. Like, like it's hard to have uh, a sort of normal, normy exchange of ideas like, oh, this candidate um, is better on these policies and this candidate is better on these policies. I think the, the underlying dynamic here is trust that he's you know, going to break the, the, the cathedral as, as well. Um, now, I don't, I don't think he has a very good track record of doing that. Um, when, it, when the rubber gets down to the road, I don't think he has a great track record of doing that. Um, but I, I do think that that trust is something you can't underestimate and can't predict. Um, I do think DeSantis has had a totally different tack, like policy-wise, uh, especially from the NatCon perspective, he's he's been absolutely much better than Trump. Um, he's, he's made really important, especially in education, I think, really important across the board um, reforms that not just any reforms reforms that show that he understands the institutional nature of the problem um so very strategic reforms that i think have been very effective um but he, and and the, the the last point in DeSantis's favor is and, and i don't know again how these two things shake out in a, in a primary because of that trust factor you know DeSantis is very much running he's very much uh kind of going more in the Octavian model than Caesar, right? Um, he's building support through competent government. Um, he, he says the right things, but there is no doubt that Trump is a more charismatic candidate and says the right things uh, that, that we, you know, hates the right people more loudly. Um, but, but DeSantis instead is going to build support through competent government for actually delivering to um, the the people who are voting for Republicans uh, what they actually want, which is a, a an ability to uh, either protect their lives and ultimately fight back against the institutionalized forces, cultural forces that seem to have invaded every aspect of their lives. And he's doing that in a competent way and delivering real results for people. I think that's that's I don't obviously there's this factor of the migration which. Um, I don't know if it's five percent or ten percent or twenty percent, right, of of his his victory margin, but the, but it exists. But I think it's also just that he won a lot of people over by simply being a competent governor. Um, so, you know, I, I I think that bodes really well for his future. I just I don't know how many more, more slots and, and how many more elections um, will will be possible in the United States. I know that sounds apocalyptic, but. Um, we, we know that that uh, essentially that the deep state struck back really, really hard against Donald Trump being elected. Um, and I'm not sure that we will have that many chances to put somebody else in that is not uh, that are not scuttled by all the same forces that I think did basically scuttle the most important innovations in the Trump administration. Now, maybe round two, he's like he understands this now and he's going to come in with a, a giant hammer and swing it around. And I would be more than happy to see that happen, particularly with regard to the civil service. Um, but to me right now, DeSantis looks like he's the strategic thinker in actually demolishing the, the power of the left in institutions in a very smart and successful way. To me, that that is like more, more appealing, but I don't, I don't think we can forget about the, the trust factor. All right, Inez, we'll transition back to you then. Um, so I, I'm going to just do a, a little bit about, uh, since police shootings are sadly uh, in, in the news once again, um, once again, we have one of these videos, viral videos that is is circulating. Um, 
And, and the, the, frankly, the, the details of the shooting um, and, and the video that's circulating really do seem over the top. Uh, they really do seem like, and there's a reason that these cops were um, instantly charged. Uh, and, but of course, then we have the, the inevitable uh, racial response, right? Even though all five cops here, um, there was an, a sixth white cop who just hung back and didn't actually participate. Um, he's been, I think, dismissed or, or put on leave or something, but the other five have been charged. Um, and then, of course, there's the inevitable racialization of, of the narrative, in this case, hilariously, because the five cops are all Black as well. Um, but that hasn't stopped folks like Kimberly Crenshaw, for example, uh, from, from saying that it's the institution of policing that is shot through with institutional racism um, that, that trains police to see Black and brown men as a threat, uh, a larger threat, and therefore that's why this happened. Even though the cops are Black, this is still systemic racism. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to go through some of um, the, the facts here uh, in, in terms of how commonly this kind of incident happens in the United States, um, why it might have happened, uh, and um, whether or not there's any evidence for uh, racial bias in policing. So um, first of all, the police have 61 million contacts uh, with, with citizens a year, um, 10 million arrests, one, around 1,000 killings, the overwhelmingly uh, overwhelming majority of which are, are uh, armed suspects. And even the ones that are... Um, quote unquote, unarmed, oftentimes um, it's a situation where uh, the, the suspect has a car, for example, and starts driving it at a cop, right? So uh, that, that might be technically unarmed, but, but uh, it's still a dangerous and, and justified killing, right? So um, liberals wildly, uh, and those on the left, wildly overestimate by a one or even two orders of magnitude how often unarmed killings happen in the United States. Um, and, and furthermore, those killings, as rare as they are, are hardly disproportionate um, if you if you take into account the baseline of underlying crime statistics rather than uh, rather than population, which is the, the silly way to look at it. Um, if you look at it on the basis of underlying crime statistics and, and likelihood of being a suspect, um, there are actually 39% more unarmed whites killed than blacks. And this, this uh, tracks very well with uh, studies that show that in police uh, simulations, training simulations, um, in, in, in those training simulations, right, uh, police are actually more likely to uh, to shoot to kill a, a similarly situated white suspect as a black suspect. And then the answers for this are obvious. Nobody wants to, you know, in the mainstream media or the corporate media, as Emily would scold me for saying, um, the, the reasons for this are obvious, right? If, if you're a cop and you kill a black suspect, there's an immediate political backlash. You're going to become the face of systemic racism in America, even if you're black, like these five cops, right? So um, there, there's a hesitation now. And that hesitation, the Ferguson effect, the, the George Floyd effect, whatever you want to call it, um, has led to thousands of excess deaths statistically from policing pullbacks. Everything from a spike um, in, in traffic deaths, right? Uh, because police are just simply not pulling over uh, black men primarily uh, when they see them, uh, for example, speeding on the road. They're not intervening. They're not actively policing. Um, everything from those kinds of deaths on, on, on the freeway to, of course, homicide. Um, and, and so this is really actually this, this policing pullback has, has caused probably many, many times more deaths statistically than any police violence or, or abuse ever has. Um, and, and so if we add up this speculation here, um, this is somewhat speculation based on, I think, the numbers that I've just read to you, as well as recruiting numbers uh, for the police. These, these five cops, apparently none of them had more than three years of experience on the force, so they're relatively rookie cops. Um, it also means they were recruited in the last several years um, where, where police have had an, a much higher time, harder time actually recruiting qualified, um, recruiting qualified candidates to be police officers. And the reasons for that are obvious. Who wants to take this job now? Um, who wants to take this job when you know that if you make a split second decision, even if it's the correct decision, let alone if you make a mistake, um, but even if it's the correct decision, you're going to become the face of white supremacy on every uh, you know, talk show and, and uh, newspaper in America. And if you make the wrong call, you not only have to live with the guilt uh, of, of, of taking a life when you shouldn't have, which is the inevitable, uh, there, there are inevitably going to be some cases where people make mistakes. Now, this video does not look like a mistake. This is rightly, I, I can see how easily uh, 
sort of the, the charges are happening quickly here in this particular video. But, um, you know, it, basically, police are no longer able to recruit quality candidates. And I wonder how much that, in addition to the Ferguson effect pullback, is actually having um, an, an effect on even the number of, of uh, police abuse incidents, right? Um, you, you are more likely to have these incidents with rookie cops who have not had as much and many years on the force, um, who were recruited out of a pool where the police are in a, um, are not in a position to turn away basically any candidates because they only have a lot of these classes, the recruiting classes are half full or a third full, they're not in the position to turn away uh, even lower quality applicants. Um, especially you can add in the, the racial affirmative action factor where uh, it's especially difficult for them to turn away black police officers given the fact that the entire focus now in policing is how do we deal with this racial component in policing. So. Um, those are kind of all the, I know that was a mishmash of, of, of facts here, um, and I want to throw it out to the crowd, whether you want to uh, discuss the media response to this shooting. Um, another interesting thing I think we could discuss is the the fact that the, the response, even though it has been, uh, there have been riots in, in several cities, is, is still somewhat muted. We, we haven't seen the same sort of George Floyd 2020 response, particularly, for example, um, from, from the Fortune 500 and from the corporate sector. Maybe that's still yet to come, but um, there's an interesting comparison there. And sorry, I took a long time with all those facts, so I'll throw it back out to you. So I've seen those same stats that Inez just read, and I'm happy that we got so statistical because this is this is a crucially, crucially important issue. Um, in fact, it, it is entirely possible that there has been no attempt at mass sustained gaslighting. There has been no, uh, there has been no massive national lie that has been more destructive, frankly, than the idea that police are inherently racist, bad actors. I, I mean, the overwhelming majority, frankly, uh, of I, I, as you know, I can't remember all those stats you just read, and as but. The overwhelming majority of homicides in this country typically happen in, you know, uh, obviously very poor, typically impoverished uh, urban areas where there is a high disproportionate number of racial minorities. You know, I think that the highest kind of X on X homicide in America is tragically black on black homicide, black on black crime in general. I mean, I, I mean, just thinking logically here, who do we think is going to be disproportionately most harmed by by the war on cops, as Heather McDonald likes ha, has always phrased it? It's obviously going to be poor, poor people just disproportionately and racial minorities disproportionately. This doesn't take necessarily a PhD in criminology to to be able to deduce that. I mean, generally speaking, you know, I would just encourage um, the listeners and viewers to basically read everything that Heather McDonald has ever written on this subject. She is the number one national expert in the country on this, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, her colleagues at MI, such as Rafa Manguel and Charles Lehman, are also excellent on, on these issues as well. And, you know, look, I mean, I, I obviously there are any number of bad actors when it comes to individual cops throughout the country. There, you're going to have some cops who want to become cops for the wrong reasons. They're not necessarily animated by a public spiritedness. Some of them actually are animated because of kind of this sense of power trip. All of that, of course, is true there. But it is so, so, so important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater when these fairly rare fairly very rare actually horrific videos come in we have to kind of keep our eye on the prize which is the fact that we've had horrifically increased homicide and violent crime rates over the past few years that is the actual public policy concern not these relatively rare one-off videos yeah um I, I mean all that is right like it's it's sir that this is still you know i mean I, one of the things is it's like it's really actually when you kind of bigoted when you think about it to see one police officer act badly on video and then assume that all police are bad or that policing in general is wrong um we wouldn't do that and i mean if you tried to do that on racial grounds you'd be called out rightfully as a racist um so probably shouldn't do it on these grounds i think there, there was something interesting about the fact that there weren't even riots in memphis like my wife actually went down there and said, I mean, there were some protests, but she she went down there with Julio Rosas and some of the other like riot journalists who regularly follow these things around. And uh, they there were riots and there were not riots in Memphis. And in talking to people there, she suggested that Memphis actually is because it's it's a majority black city with a lot of, of crime. They really do actually value their police officers in Memphis. So they were never going to actually do the kind of crazy rioting that you would expect given the fact that most of the people there really do not want the police going anywhere they would need they need police protection very badly um and 
you know, there, it lacks that sort of white liberal Antifa element, like compare how Portland would react to the slightest aggression by police to what Memphis did. Um, and yet people still kind of, you know, people were still stoking the fires of it. Um, there's one other aspect about that shooting and, and why would happen. Oh yeah, the, the lack of ambiguity. I think part of the thing about that video is, you know, there, what you could say about the George Floyd, Derek Chauvin thing, it's not actually, there is some ambiguity about whether or not that was a murder, whether what caused his death, et cetera. But here it's not really, not really any question. The guys just beat him to a pulp. And, and so when there's not really ambiguity, there's not really a lot for anybody to get angry about in the sense of, okay, well, some, these guys clearly committed murder and they're now being prosecuted for it. And what, you know, what, there's no racial angle either because everybody was black. So, you know, what are you going to do? I think, you know, maybe it, it may not be that all these riots are played out already, but certainly in this case, I don't think there was enough factual fodder in this event to really sustain anything. I'll just quickly add, and I can combine this with my final thought for uh, everyone else to I'll toss it open to everyone. Um, this doesn't neatly fit any narrative except for the narrative that Memphis has had a really hard time uh, recruiting police officers, retaining police officers uh, in the past. A, a colleague of mine is working on a story about that just right now. Um, I went back and looked at some articles about the city sort of struggling on that note. And, you know, when you make policing miserable, you're, and, and again, that's not to say there aren't excesses in the police force, but when it, it sort of takes the media um, and you take those sort of last talking points and Democrats run with it and the media colludes with them to blow this up into a major narrative, uh, you end up with a, a really difficult line of work. That's a, also a really essential line of work. Um, and so more people are going to be put in danger because of this. They had lowered the standards. Uh, two of these officers were hired in August of 2020. I would imagine, this is purely speculative, I don't know, I would imagine that was a very hard time for the Memphis Police Department to retain and recruit police officers. Um, so I have no idea uh, what happened there, but that does seem like a possibility. So this, this doesn't neatly fit into any sort of left narrative about policing. Um, I'm so open to the idea that we don't know the full story. The video is obviously awful. What we learn time and again is that sometimes these videos look really awful and then they become even more awful and more comp complicated as the facts uh, start to come in over the course of the next few weeks. So I'm open to that, but uh, this is uh, very much connected to the story we started with here, which is without the media's collusion um, with you know the, the Hamilton 68 dashboard run by the German Marshall Fund and the Alliance for Securing Democracy, uh, this would have gone nowhere. The narrative would never have gotten off the ground because the media would have had to second to think, hey, all these ex-spooks are trying to sell me on a very dubious piece of research that just confirms their priors and our priors and is baked into this narrative. Doesn't the FBI have a history of doing this with reporters? Oh yeah, maybe we should hit the brakes. Uh, so I think time and again, when you hit these stories without the media's collusion, we have a much, much healthier country. And that brings me to my final point, that which is I, I genuinely think the American media is the biggest problem that we're facing in American politics. Um, obviously, there are cultural problems that create our utterly corrupt media. Um, but in terms of our politics, you could you could honestly go a long way to fixing myriad problems in American politics if you were able to wave a magic wand and just get the media back to a baseline of like mild center left bias. Um, but you know, like there's some semblance of interest in challenging power. So with that, I'll turn it over to everybody else for, for their final thoughts. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in here. Um, the, we're going to find out really quickly uh, that that the institution of policing is the, the alternative is is not the um, and and uh, Will brought up Antifa, but the it, it, the the alternative is Chaz, right? Um, the return to the state of nature is incredibly violent um, and stressful and makes people unable to accomplish basic daily life tasks. Uh, that is the reality without the police. Um, and, and there's no appreciation of that fact now uh, in, in mainstream discourse about the police. And that's just like a, a really basic sort of pre-political um, fact. And, and then speaking of the political, I wanted to return us to Josh's topic for a moment because I think it is really important. Um, you know, self-government requires both a, a certain kind of cultural uh, training and muscle memory, uh, but it also has to be reinforced by daily practice, right? Um, 
you know, you, you can have the best sort of cultural genetics, right? Um, and here I'm using genetics metaphorically to be clear, but you can have, you can have the best cultural genetics for self-government um, and lose them over time uh, when, when those, those routines are not practiced, when you're not actually used to working out political problems with your fellow citizens um, through a legitimate representative government. Um, we've now had uh, over a century of atrophying those muscles. Uh, and and it, what Emily said, I think is very true that the American people, it's not just because of civic education, these things are all, all sort of downstream, I think from, from losing that, that muscle memory of actually governing ourselves. Um, and and that's, that's, a, that's a real problem, right? We talk a lot on this show about the problem with the elites, um, and that's certainly true, but but there is this slow atrophy of the ability to actually govern ourselves, um, and that requires an enormous amount of self-discipline. It's not easy. It has to be part of the tradition handed down to you, and you yourself have to participate in it to keep it strong. And and that's that's a that's a much deeper problem uh, that we're facing in in many ways on the problem with the elites. So I, I have two. I have like a two-part final thought kind of dovetailing off multiple of our segments here. The first is I want to kind of partially respond to something that Emily said, which is very important, and I want to just kind of highlight it. Emily was talking a little bit about kind of the incentive structure and the woes of police rec recruiting right now. That is a huge problem, and that has been a massive, massive problem ever since the George Floyd riots started in the summer of 2020. NYPD recruitment has absolutely plummeted. All these other kind of large urban area police departments are, are, are publicly kind of bewailing the fact that they are having an incredibly difficult time re recruiting new people. And, you know, again, that is so easily foreseeable. I mean, like who in the right mind in today's toxic culture, you know, where every time that there was a one-off horrific incident in, in whatever town or city across the country, there was kind of mass rioting, defund the police, you know, some of the particularly nasty stuff uh, about like fry them like bacon that we see from the true, true, true lunatics on the far left in places like Ferguson, Missouri and whatnot there. I mean, like, you know, who would want to be a cop right now? This is something that Rafa Manguel, who I mentioned earlier, has written about a lot because if I'm not mistaken, his father was a cop and it's kind of personal to him. But, you know, fundamentally, if you're trying to solve the problem, if you actually think that police reform is, is really necessary as a public policy matter, you should be trying to get better people to be cops. You shouldn't be trying to tear down the institution of the police unless, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you're actually a Marxist or an anarchist, which, oh, by the way, Black Lives Matter quite publicly actually is. <laughs> So, um, you know, I, I guess that kind of answers that question. But, you know, again, it just belies any kind of seriousness um, of anyone who happens to think that, quote unquote, police reform is, is, is a pressing measure. Um, I, I don't necessarily think it is. There are, there are probably some one off kind of policy, small kind of incremental things I, I might do. But, you know, I kind of want just to underscore that if you were serious, if you were actually serious about reforming the police as the police reform crowd likes to do, you would not just be vilifying the entire profession. You'd be trying to get better people to be cops. The other just quick thing I want to do, just to go back briefly to the uh, DeSantis Trump topic that we covered earlier. Um, I, I don't remember the exact statistics, but the column that I wrote after election day in November was about kind of just the, the great election night that that Florida had. And if you look at the percentage of people uh, of new Florida residents during Ron DeSantis's governorship, you know, a, 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 an incredibly high percentage of them have subsequently registered here in the state of Florida as Republicans. And of course, you know, when DeSantis won the governorship the first time in the 2018 election over, uh, you know, the possible felon Andrew Gillum, you know, uh, Democrats had I think like a three to four hundred thousand vote advantage in the state of Florida. Republicans now in Florida have a five to six hundred thousand vote advantage, if I'm not mistaken. There, the Democratic Party is just totally wiped out here. Manny Diaz, Democratic Party state chair here in Florida, has recently resigned. Nikki Freed, who lost the gubernatorial primary to Charlie Crist, has said that the party is basically in tatters. You know, I, I mean, the, the Florida Democratic Democratic Party here is in horrible, horrible shape. I mean, the latest rumors are that it might not even be a contested state at all um, in, in the 2024 election, which is just astounding. I mean, again, guys, you know, this is the state of Florida, like, you know, the, the hanging chads, the recounts from 2000, all of that. So, you know, uh, again, like... <laughs> If Trump or anyone for that matter is trying to 
criticize DeSantis, especially on, on the signature issue, the issue that has attracted this mass migration here, you know, I mean, don't take our word for it. The proof is literally empirically speaking right there in the data. So, you know, I, I, I just don't understand that attack. I just really don't. And I think the people are frankly going to see right through it. Yeah. So um, my thoughts are that the cathedral is the problem, whether it's the Hamilton 68 misinformation issue, that's a, you know, a unholy alliance between ex intelligence agency officials, the media and these academics trying to put together these like disinformation research proposed, you know, studies, that sort of thing. Um, it's the basic problem, as we talked about in what Josh identified the difference between popular sovereignty and quote unquote, our democracy. And uh, it's also, I mean, it also, it comes into play in the police because the sort of, you know, mainstream narrative in liberal circles, which means, you know, in establishment circles, is that local police officers are these horrible bigots and that it needs to, they, the local police should be defunded. And really, it's almost a way to create more federal control over local police departments, cathedral control. And who's the guy who's going to stop it? Well, it's Ron DeSantis. I mean, even as we're recording this, he put out uh, a new proposal for higher education reform that would absolutely uh, reshape the way that uh, liberals are able to, and especially university professors are able to control their own universities and put that control back in the hands of university presidents and other political appointees. Um, and I think it's going to be really awesome. I, I know we didn't have a chance to fully talk about it, but some stuff like giving university presidents full power over hiring and firing in a way that was previously unallowed because faculty committees could put forward a list of candidates and the university president was constrained to that whatever the faculty wanted. Um, stuff like that. So yeah, Ron DeSantis is the man. That's that's my final thought. Well, on behalf of Will, Inez, and Josh, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Emily Jashinsky, and we'll see you at the next NatCon Squad.